Thank you, uh, Chairman Adolph. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us today. Um, my first question is to set it up uh, as fiduciaries, the board members of both SIRS and PSIRS uh, must act solely in the interests of their members, of their respective system, and for the exclusive benefit of the applicable system's members. I understand that these duties are certainly established in statute and that the board members must comply with the law, of course. But with that said, does that provide for your board members um, as part of their fiduciary responsibility to take the interests of taxpayers who ultimately help to fund the system into account? The fiduciary duty is strictly to the members of the fund, to the beneficiaries of the fund. Um, obviously, if um, the funds aren't coming in to provide the benefits, that's certainly a consideration, but fiduciary duty is loyalty to the beneficiaries of the fund. And I, I think that uh, to the uh, commentary side, I think that certainly uh, is, is what highlights our problem here with the inherent problems that are created because of a defined benefit structure um, that we have in place today and the political nature of that structure with the decisions that are being made regarding the structure if they're ultimately not taking the interest of the taxpayer who has to help fund it into mind, um, especially this unfunded liability that they're funding um, a hefty tab for both uh, in the school districts and from the state. The board decisions uh, regarding the contracts with investment managers impact both the system's members and, as I'd mentioned earlier, the taxpayers. And given that the fees paid to the managers are substantial and really eat away at the bottom line, how much did your respective systems pay to investment, man investment managers in the most recent fiscal period, if you have those numbers? Uh, yeah, for our uh, uh, fiscal year end of 2014, we paid out uh, $482 million in investment management fees for the year. And just to give a little bit of color related to that, we received about $1.2 billion net of fees, excess returns above the indexes that those uh, portfolio managers manage against. And which, which indexes? Uh, board's policy index. The board approves a policy index every year. It, it contains the indexes the board, of the board's asset allocation. So things like uh, global equity indexes, bond indexes, so on and so forth. So there's a, a plethora of indexes as to how we allocate our assets. And managers are hired with the responsibility of getting us index returns plus something above the cost that we pay them. So the, the board has set the index? Correct. Your board. Our board sets the policy index annually. Correct. Okay. And it's in our it's on our website. It's in our investment policy statement. Uh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And from the SIRS size, we paid uh, 182 million dollars in fees to managers, or roughly uh, 0.66 basis points. Thank you. And last year, I understand the the hearings here, the appropriation hearings that uh, some members had raised questions at that time regarding the fees that were paid. Have you made any changes since last year to today at this hearing regarding the fees and the payment of those? The fees are always uh, an item of interest for us. This is not any one particular time that we focus on fees especially. Fees are a mandate from the board. Uh, the staff is, is given the direction to negotiate the most favorable fees possible for the best quality investments that we can find. So it's not a, it's not a one step program or a, a short term program, it's a continuous way of operation. So essentially, since concerns were raised last year, there haven't been any changes made because of the concerns that were raised last year by members of the Preparations Committee? Not solely because of concerns that were raised, we have that concern always. Ma'am? Yes, as uh, a board chair for PSERS, uh, I need to talk a little bit about the fees from my perspective. Uh, at PSERS, uh, the kinds of fees that you get if you have an index fund uh, are mostly uh, handled in-house for us. So we do that ourselves and save considerable money by, by not paying fees for the index uh, fund types. However, in order to uh, take care of our, uh, as I said before, uh, we have to uh, make sure that we can pay our annuitants. And because of that, we have to have a, a different asset allocation. And it is an asset allocation question that determines a lot of the fees. If we were to have all our money in index funds, we would not make our target of 7.5%. So therefore, we have to have a varied asset allocation. We are also very careful 
that when we pay fees, as uh, Mr. Grossman said, uh, the operation returns an excess amount of money. So it's not a simple thing of looking at the, at the amount of the fee. It's the fee in relation to the asset uh, allocation and the asset in question. Which your, your answer provides a good segue to the kind of follow-up question, which to continue that discussion on the fees that are being paid. Um, I have a question regarding the information that I'd read in the most recent PSERS comprehensive annual financial report. And the report indicated that PSERS generated gross excess returns of $6.1 billion from active management from 2011 to 2014, paid $2.1 billion in fees, and netted a gain of $4 billion. The report says that, quote, without active management, PSERS net investment income would have been $4 billion lower. Can you clarify that statement? Yeah, yeah when, you, when you look at the policy index that the board has approved, um, that had a specific return, all right, a specific dollar return related to it. The managers that we hired, because they did well, net of their fees, earned an incremental $4 billion over the index from their active management decisions. And it, I can give you a quick example of how we look at it, if that would be helpful. Uh, in 2000 and Eight, we hired our first MLP manager, Harvest Fund Advisors, out of Wayne, Pennsylvania, with a small $50 million allocation. We indexed that portfolio primarily for the next three and a quarter years so we could gain an understanding of the marketplace and whether there was inefficiencies that could be exploited by active managers. At the end of the three and a quarter year, year period, we determined, one, we like the asset class, so we increased our allocation. It's up to 4% today. We have about $2 billion invested in man, uh, master limited partnerships. And we also went to hire fully active managers. We actually hired two additional managers, increased the allocation to harvest in, uh, in Wayne. And as a result of that, for this, from mid-2012 through the end of 2014, those managers earned index returns plus $250 million net of all the fees that were paid to them, which were about 50 basis points on the assets. That is an asset class we could manage internally at essentially no cost. We have the capabilities to do that. However, because we view it as an inefficient asset class, we decided it was in the best interest of the fund to actively manage there. And that decision, obviously, has, has created $250 million of incremental income. So that's sort of an example of how we think about active management. Can these managers generate a return in excess of the index net of their fees? And in this case, they can. If the situation changes in the future where we see that that ability goes away, and it could go away because the market could become more efficient over time, then we would make a decision to move back to passive management. Thank you. Well, Regarding the procurement of investment services, do the systems procure investment professional services using procedures in Section 518 of the Procurement Code, the competitive selection procedures for certain services? Uh, we do have a, an RFP process internally, but it is not the same process as the, um, as the standard uh, RFP process is. But there is a process in place that's very similar in structure to that. Yeah, we, we have a specific, uh, excuse me, we have a specific exemption for that for the investment professionals, but there is a specific process that the board has mandated to the staff that requires both staff and consultants review any potential investment before it reaches them. That's so it's not under 518 of the procurement code that you're operating? We have an exemption from that particular provision. Okay. And so what, what provision? are you operating under? It's just the exception, exemption from, we, from we that section. The There's no other, no other section of the procurement code or any process under the procurement code that you're operating under. Right. No, it's my understanding that we have received a specific exemption from having to use the procurement code for that particular investment uh, consultant or, or management uh, uh, service. That does not exempt anybody else in the organization, however, we do follow that. Can you describe the steps to that process and give me any examples of the criteria that the board is using for the procurement? Um, I uh, yeah, as, as, as we procure managers, they're usually on a more idiosyncratic basis, manager by manager. Uh, the process generally is the, the staff will interview and review any manager coming through for, their, for our approval, and then we will also get uh, the approval of our consultant. We have con specialty consultants in the various asset classes. It's a dual process. Both staff and the investment consultant have to sign off on the manager before it goes to the board, and then the board does approve each manager that comes through. So besides that subjective interview process, what criteria do you have set 
Well, we particular. look at you know, whether the manager has uh, a process that we believe is uh, t universal and timeless, essentially, something that we believe that they're going to be able to make value or earn money over time above the index. Um, we'll also look at their past history, look at the risks that they take. Um, look at the people involved, get a feel for well, whether they're experts at their given field. Um, and it tends to have both a qualitative aspect, which is the people in the process, as well as a quantitative aspect, how they've historically have done, but even more importantly, how we believe they're going to do in the future. So do either entities have a written procurement process that you're following, or is it just through the subjective evaluation of the individuals that are involved in in these uh, interviews. Oh, my name is Tom Breyer. I'm over at SERS, uh, Chief Investment Officer. We, uh, we have a written investment advisor policy that we follow. And uh, in our case, our board uh, biannually now, but previously annually, did a strategic investment plan. And as Jim pointed out, we look at the capital markets going forward. We look at our system, how much we have to pay out, the liquidity, the risk profile that we need, and what we use our consultants. And we put together an asset allocation framework that drives our whole investment management hiring process. And so it, within that process, if we have an area that we would like to develop opportunities, uh, we will bottom up, look for opportunities either from our consultant or, or from staff. Uh, and then the investment process will take over. And we, we really look at four major areas. Uh, we look at the people and the history of the people that are going to be running the money. Uh, we look at the investment philosophy, uh, how they're going to make the money, whether you can replicate the strategy, whether it's a durable, sustainable model, we look at the process they use, and finally we look quantitatively at the performance and, and understand the performance of where it comes from. So we have a very disciplined process. We have two, a belt and suspenders approach. We have staff uh, do due diligence as well as our consultant, and dual memos have to go to the board making recommend, recommendations based on those criteria. And the board makes the ultimate decision and, and in some cases turns managers down. Can you uh, share a copy of your written process with the uh, members of the committee and, and my committee? Mm -hmm. Sure. And we can also get you the exception information. Thank you. Exemption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.